Hi, I'm Eric Curlin from 3D Space, the Center for Stereoscopic Photography, Art, Cinema, and Education. We're the Museum of 3D in Los Angeles. I want to talk to you a little about the history of 3D in the 20th century and one of my favorite 3D viewers, the Viewmaster. Now, I'm sure a lot of you grew up with Viewmaster toys. And in fact, this is my original Viewmaster from my childhood in the 1970s. But the history of the Viewmaster actually goes all the way back to the 1930s, when a German immigrant named William Gruber designed a new version of what had been a really popular form of entertainment in the Victorian period, the stereoscope. He sold his idea to the Sawyers Company of Portland, Oregon. And at the 1939 World's Fair in New York, they introduced the Viewmaster. This is a Model A 1939 model Viewmaster. You can see it actually opens up like a clamshell, and the reel goes inside. The really cool thing is the reels from 1939 are the exact same size and shape as the reels today. So you can actually go get a new Viewmaster viewer, and you can take an 80-year-old reel, pop it in, and the Kodachrome pictures look like they were just taken yesterday. Now, when the Viewmaster was first introduced, it wasn't actually intended to be a kid's toy. It was actually used for tourism. It allowed people to see things and visit places all around the world. And it wasn't until after World War II that they really started marketing it for kids. This is the 1950s version of the Viewmaster. This is the Model C, uh, introduced after World War II and was very popular. Um, you can see it actually has the slot in the top where the reel goes. So it's a, a much more familiar design. And uh, at this point, the Sawyers Company created their own in-house art department. Now, you may remember uh, from your childhood seeing reels that had diorama scenes with sculpted figures, uh, like the ones here in the display cases around me. Uh, these figures are from cartoon reels of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. These were sculpted by an artist named Joe Liptak. But the first artist who worked at Sawyers was a woman named Florence Thomas. And I want to show you a few of the holiday-themed reels that Florence Thomas designed. Here you can see Florence Thomas in the art studio at Sawyers in Portland, Oregon. This gives you a good idea of the scale of the dioramas that she created. In order to create the Viewmaster reels, the photographers would take a left eye picture of the scene and then move the camera slightly to the right and take another picture from the right eye point of view. Florence Thomas created sculpted illustrations for many children's stories, including this holiday favorite. You know Dasher and Dancer, and I'm sure you know Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You're probably most familiar with the 1964 stop-motion animated TV version of the story that features the song by Johnny Marks. Or maybe you know the 1949 Gene Autry recording of that song. But what you probably don't know is that the original story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was written by Robert L. May for the Montgomery Ward Department Store, which distributed it in their holiday gift book in 1939. May's sister was married to songwriter Johnny Marks, who wrote the song in 1948. The song became so popular that the Sawyers Company licensed the story from May and released this reel, dated 1950, to tell the story. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer The day before Christmas, the young reindeer were having a grand time. They were playing, but they wouldn't let one little reindeer play with them. They called him names. Look at Rudolph with his big, red, shiny nose. Rudolph cried. He wished his nose was like the others, small and brownish, not shiny. Rudolph hoped that Santa Claus, who was already packing his sleigh, would remember what a good little reindeer he had been all year, even though his nose did look funny. Everybody looked so happy as they helped Santa, except Rudolph, who stood back and looked very sad. Why is my nose so red and shiny, Rudolph sobbed to himself. That Christmas Eve was very foggy and very, very dark. Santa and his reindeer couldn't go fast and were having a hard time finding their way. They tangled in the treetops and barely missed hitting a four-motored plane. 
Inside the house, Santa tripped and stumbled in the dark. He could scarcely see to choose the right presence, until he came to the room that was lighted by sleeping Rudolph's big red shining nose. Santa woke Rudolph and said, You can save the day for me by lighting the way through this terrible fog. The children will get their presents in time after all. Rudolph was very happy. His nose lighted the way as he led Santa's sleigh through the dark, foggy sky. Santa was happy too. His troubles were over. Inside the houses too, Rudolph's nose gave just enough light for Santa to choose the right gifts from his pack. When they returned home, Santa told all the other reindeer how Rudolph's red nose had lighted the way. All the reindeer children cheered him as a hero. Rudolph blushed from his head to his toes. Then Santa made him commander-in-chief to lead his reindeer and sleigh on every dark, foggy Christmas Eve. In 1955, Sawyers revisited the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer story and released this three-reel set, taking the original reel that they'd created and adding two more stories that you've probably never heard before. Rudolph and Jay Batty, the Brilliant Bear One Christmas, Santa Claus gave Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Grover Groundhog a new job as detectives. Every night, most of our entire day's production of candy canes disappears, Santa told them. About midnight, Rudolph and Grover heard a deep voice inside the candy storeroom saying, Ha ha! I sure love peppermint canes. Grover opened the door quickly, and there in the glow of Rudolph's nose was J. Batty Bear. He's getting away, cried Rudolph, as J. Batty bounded out the door and passed them. Lend me your horns, Rudolph, Grover said. My horns, Rudolph exclaimed. What for? Look, with a rubber band and a handful of beans and... Stretching the rubber band around Rudolph's horns, Grover made a fine slingshot. Ping, ping! They pelted the runaway bear with jelly beans. Yipes! He yelled and dropped every cane. Still smarting from the jelly bean bombardment, J. Batty Bear paced up and down in his cave, muttering, That Rudolph thinks he's pretty smart, but I know how I'll fix him. In his shop, J. Batty started working feverishly. There was a determined scowl on his face as glass tubing, wires, batteries all grew into an odd device. Then a few days before Christmas, he knocked on Santa's door. He had a big box in his hands and a very wise look on his face. I've come on business, Santa, J. Batty said. Business that will put a certain red-nosed reindeer out of business. He unpacked the box, wrapped red tubing around himself, and attached a control box. Now watch, he said, and flicked a switch. Suddenly he was floating and glowing like a Christmas candle. Santa scratched his head and said, It is spectacular, and it just may make Rudolph out of date. Rudolph dropped his head and gulped. That's all right, Santa. Whatever is best for the team. On Christmas Eve, Santa's sleigh was loaded so heavily with the many toys he had made that the reindeer couldn't budge it. And to top it all, J. Batty Bear's neon outfit wouldn't work. J. Batty Bear cried, Boo-hoo! I wanted to be bigger and better and more popular than Rudolph. Nobody could be more popular than Rudolph, said Grover. But if you really want to help, he whispered into Jay Batty's ear. Santa climbed onto the load of toys and called, Up, Rudolph! Up, Dancer and Prancer! But the sleigh didn't move an inch. I'll help, Santa, said Jay Batty. I'll push. That Christmas, through darkness and cold, Rudolph's glowing nose guided Santa Claus to each chimney top and J. Batty Bear pushed the sleigh with all his might so that boys and girls everywhere could have a very Merry Christmas. Rudolph and Uncle Bigby, the Blue-Nosed Reindeer 
Perhaps because all of his life people have laughed at his blue nose, Rudolph's uncle Bigby was a rude, crabby old miser. When visiting Rudolph, he sneered, Merry Christmas! Bah! Humbug! In fact, he banged his walking stick on Santa's workshop floor and told Santa, Why you waste your time making a lot of silly toys for children, I'll never know. No kinfolk of mine is going to work in such nonsense. Come, nephew. Head bowed, Rudolph followed his uncle. Uncle Bigby, I wish you would try to understand how Santa Claus makes children happy, Rudolph said as they trudged across the ice. Humph, grunted Uncle Bigby. All I can say is that it's a good thing you left that silly old man who fritters his time away. Rudolph flared. You can't call Santa Claus a silly old man. And furthermore, I'm going right back now to help him. Nephew, shouted Uncle Bigby, jabbing his sharp walking stick on the ice. Come back this instant. The last jab was too much. Crack, crack. Uncle Bigby's cane had broken the ice, and he began to float away. Rudolph ran to Santa's workshop and cried, Help! Uncle's on an ice floe. He'll drown. Reindeer afloat, called Santa Claus. Hitch up the reindeer team. Ho, dancer. Ho, prancer. Soon they were in the air, but Rudolph's uncle was nowhere to be found. They searched until dark. Then Santa told Rudolph to turn his nose on. Its red glow swept the waves like a searchlight. Santa, Rudolph cried. There he is and a polar bear is after him. We must do something. In his excitement, Rudolph jumped out of the sleigh and landed kerplunk right on the bear's head, stunning him. Harumph, said Uncle Bigby. I'm glad you arrived in time for once. Rudolph gulped. A lot of good that will do when this bear wakes up. Santa can't land his sleigh here either. From the sleigh circling overhead, Grover Groundhog's voice came down. Here, Rudolph, use this. And a magnifying glass landed on the bear's soft fur without breaking. I'll try, said Rudolph doubtfully. A fine thing, commented Uncle Bigby. A huge polar bear lies there, and my nephew needs a glass to see him. But Rudolph's nose glowed cherry red, and the big lens concentrated the rays in one fiery spot. The bear awoke, yow, he yelled as the beam burned deeper and deeper. Ouch, ouch, he yelped and jumped into the icy waters. Santa threw down a pole ladder, but Uncle Bigby was too old and creaky in his joints to climb it. Rudolph dug in his sharp little hoofs and called up to the sleigh. Head for land, we'll ice a plane in. Mr. Santa Claus, he croaked, shaking his stick angrily. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's people not having a Merry Christmas. Furthermore, I insist that you take this money and make some poor children extra happy. Santa winked at Rudolph and made a magic sign. For Santa is a magic man, you know. And all the little elves cheered. For Uncle Bigby's awful blue nose was as red as Rudolph's, though not as shining. I hope you've enjoyed these Holiday Viewmaster stories. If you'd like to learn more about the history of 3D or our 3D museum, you can visit our website at 3dspace.org. That's 3-dspace.org, where you can sign up for our mailing list and our Patreon and learn about all of the upcoming 3D events we have going on throughout the year. And before I go, I have one last Viewmaster story that I'd like to share with you. It's another holiday story that I'm sure you know, featuring artwork by Florence Thomas. The Night Before Christmas by Clement C. Moore T'was the night before Christmas, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. 
when out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave a luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles the coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop his coursers they flew, with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke, it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a round little belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. <laughs>